Investment Officer, Mr. Michael Enriquez. Good morning, everyone. So, I think the last time you were here was May, or mid year. Mid year. So, I think I'm just going to go through the what we projected, what what went well, what didn't go as planned. But probably before I start, I just want to build on the, the point of GB on the money market fund. Uh, I think it's a good start up fund for new investors. Uh, Upon checking today, the, the the yield of the fund right now is about 3.5% net per annum. So I think that's it's a good start. Um, it's not as volatile as your equity fund, and then the yield is still a lot better compared to any time deposit out there that you can access with just as little as 100 pesos. So I think it's worthwhile looking at it. Okay. So. Going to the update on the market, I think um, looking back in 2019, I think during the start of the year, we were really bullish on the whole market. And for one, everybody was uh, caught by surprise when the government was not able to pass their budget in time, where it really curtailed a lot of the spending. That's why when we first got the uh, the one Q GDP figure, it was way below expectations of, the, of I think, everyone. Um, that's why that started the disappointment on more so on the equity markets. I think on the fixed income side, most of the market players called it right. Interest rates really went down. And in fact, if you have a bond fund, it should have performed better than your equity fund for this year because interest rates started going down. And I think we were correct there. But what we missed this year was the PSEI. I think we were too optimistic on our targets where I think most of the companies really delivered, especially the property, the banking sector. But there was so much overhang, uh, external threats, some internal, that really brought the market lower compared to where we would expect it to be at, at this point in time towards the year end. But so going through the, the different market drivers, on the positive side, I think the BSP has delivered. And in fact, they delivered even better than expectations by the market players. Um, we were, in fact, not expecting a very aggressive um, policy rate cut by the BSP. They delivered 75 basis points. And I think rightfully so because inflation started going down. The reserve requirement was uh, a welcoming <coughs> surprise. We know that the BSP will cut its reserve, the triple R but we weren't expecting it to be very aggressive at 400 basis points. And then that really drove um, interest rates much lower and of course helped banks in terms of uh, more liquidity available in the system. As you well know, the new BSB governor is really pro-growth and that has been translated into his policies. And I think next year um, we can see more of these happening in the market. So for next year, I think we ex still expect the BSP to continue to deliver um, rate cuts, um, at least one next year. And I think as what the BSP governor mentioned, he would play it by ear. Um, it's, it's really inflation targeting for the BSP. So as inflation continues to stabilize, um, I think we have really seen the peak from where from 2018 where inflation was at 6.7%, I think, September 2018. That was uh, when we had that rice supply crisis. So now I think it's over. So we expect inflation to normalize. On corporate earnings, um, we were a bit surprised as well when 
during the start of the year, we were just projecting about 11% earnings growth for the market. That's why in spite of the 11% earnings growth, we already have a very bullish target for the PSEI. And as of the third quarter, we the PSEI constituents actually delivered 13% earnings growth. And this has been driven more by the banks and the property sector. So there's really a lot of fundamental reason why the, PS, the PSEI should be at a much higher level from where it is at the moment. But let me talk to you about uh, some external threats later. Okay, in GDP, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's the budget impasse that really dragged GDP. But now the government has been accelerating its uh, spending. And I think this fourth quarter, we're expecting GDP to register um, about 6.6%, um, 65 to 6.6%. Given the accelerated spending of the of the of the government, so oh, and GDP for 2019, we're expecting it to be about six percent. Um, but for next year, since we're hopeful that uh, both uh, Senate can still pass the budget by the this the last uh, hearing on December 20, so that really can. Uh, enable the government to start spending on day one next year. So that's why we're targeting about 7% for next year. So hopefully we can see a 7% GDP growth for next year because the only drag this year was really the, the delay in the budget release. So once the budget has been uh, released earlier and now the government has identified more infrastructure projects to be started next year. So definitely we can expect more spending and more economic activity happening. However, the negative, um, some external threats continue to hound us. I think for one is the US-China trade war. It's still there. Um, it's, we've been hearing the same news that there might be a resolution and then sometimes there might be no resolution again. So we'll just play it by ear. But in spite of that, the U.S. Um, economy, um, there's signs that it's slowing down um, in terms of its industrial production. But I think if ever they slip into a recession in the next 12 months, we expect that to be very shallow. And the Fed has, is always there to be able to cut rates in order to help the, the economy not to slip into recession. So hopefully, we're wrong that the, the, the U.S. won't have any recession because any slowdown in the U.S. will also affect global markets. On the dollar peso, uh, I think it's, it's a good story for the dollar peso. Um, a lot of the economist has, uh, has been uh, more pessimistic during the start of the year. And then we have seen the peso appreciate uh, more than expected. Uh, previously, we were at 52 year end. Now we're just expecting the peso to hover around 51 level. And then next year, the, the peso would probably uh, be within these target ranges as well. And a big factor of this would be a lot of hot money coming into the Philippines. And not really towards equities, but more so towards the fixed income. Remember that the rest of the world some of the developed markets continue to experience negative interest rates. So a lot of the foreign funds are in search of yield and most of them go to more stable emerging markets and they buy into our government bonds. That's why you've seen rates go down as well. So I then talked about recession. Um, hopefully we don't see a, a really deep recession in the U.S. So speaking about that, we're monitoring closely industrial production in the US and there's some signs that it's slowing down. Um, however, there is the Fed that still has a lot of room to ease further their policy rates in order to pump prime the economy to start growth again. But the other side to it is if you look at the company earnings of the 
of the listed firms, they seem to be re registering very strong growth. That's why if you look at S&P, the Dow Jones, it's still at all-time highs. But the overall U.S., there's still signs, some signs that the economy is starting to slow down. But remember next year, it's a critical year because it's U.S. elections November. So a lot of the, the focus will be for, for, for the incumbent president, for President Trump, to ensure that the market is stable, that the economy won't slip into recession because it's his ticket to being re-elected. So clearly, there should be more activity going into the U.S. market in terms of how he can support and the Fed can support the U.S. economy from slipping into a recession. On oil, Again, there's been a lot of um, talks on the OPEC Plus to continue to cut its production in order to stabilize or bring up oil uh, prices to more comfortable levels for them. But again, there's still a lot of supply coming from the US as well as overall global demand has been slowing down. That's why we have been seeing some price stability on oil. So. Definitely next year, we don't see oil as a big threat in terms of um, how it can disrupt markets and more so for the Philippines to disrupt our inflation forecast. And um, based on our models, it can only significantly affect our inflation forecast if oil reaches $100 per barrel. But as long as it's within a range of a 50 to $65 per barrel, then I think we're a bit safe in terms of uh, inflation uh, spiking up again driven by higher oil prices. Okay, so speaking of inflation, um, we have seen a significant uh, drop on this figure given that the government was able to address the rice supply. And for next year, um, we expect inflation to move up a bit from, from the average for this year, given that there may be some issues, uh, effects on the African swine flu, um, affecting some of the alternative uh, food, like chicken um, and meat and fish, as well as the prolonged El Nino can, can affect some uh, price of uh, food. But overall, we expect inflation to stabilized within 3% for 2020. Uh, and for this year, we're expecting inflation to average at about 2.4%. Um, although for November inflation, we were not expecting it to register at a much higher rate of about 1.3%. Our own house view was just 0.9%. We were expecting that food uh, moved up significantly from uh, from our own estimates. But for next year, I don't think inflation will be a big factor. So this is quite important because if inflation is sta stable, then we don't see any spike in interest rates or the BSP to start increasing rates again. So that's good for overall economy to support uh, further growth. Okay, speaking of uh, the market, the PSEI, and the 10 years. So for us investors, what we do is we compare the yield of a, a government security, a 10-year bond, versus the implied earnings yield of the PSEI. And early part of this year, a lot of the investors shied away from the equity market because you, they've seen a lot of banks offering high time deposit rates, high um, fixed income instruments that definitely attracted money coming out of the equity market, moving into more fixed return instruments. But as inflation started to go down and as interest rates started to go down, we have seen again a wider gap 
from the implied earnings yield of the equity market as opposed to um, a 10-year bond yield. Right now, um, as the peak of the 10-year, um, I remember in 2018 when, the in when inflation peaked at 6.7 was 8%. So last September 2018, the 10-year government bond rate was close to 8. Now, it's just at 4.5%. So naturally, if you if, uh, if can have access to an 8% bond versus equities, you probably go to bonds. But as interest rates started going down, again, normalizing, then the attractiveness of going into riskier assets such as equities will be there. And right now, 10-year rate is at 4.5, and our forecast is that 10-year rate can still further go lower, closer to 4, then all the more, there would be heightened interest to risky assets because the, the promise for a yield would be more uh, favorable towards equities than fixed income as rates go down. So, and this year, it was really dominated by fixed income because rate, um, interest rates started going down. So why all the fixed income investors are quite happy and equity investors were just flat. But now, um, our view is that next year, interest rates can go down but to a lower magnitude, but there's a bigger potential for the PSEI to bring